This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kelly Wisher of Mattapoisett, Massachusetts. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 27 The Story. First, sir, said Caderousse, you must make me a promise. What is that? inquired the abbe. Why, if you ever make use of the details I am about to give you, that you will never let any one know that it was I who supplied them, for the persons of whom I am about to talk are rich and powerful, and if they only laid the tips of their fingers on me, I should break to pieces like glass. Make yourself easy, my friend, replied the abbe. I am a priest, and confessions die in my breast. Recollect, our only desire is to carry out, in a fitting manner, the last wishes of our friend. Speak, then, without reserve, as without hatred. Tell the truth, the whole truth. I do not know, never may know, the persons of whom you are about to speak. Besides, I am an Italian, and not a Frenchman, and belong to God, and not to men, and I shall shortly retire to my convent, which I have only quitted to fulfill the last wishes of a dying man. This positive assurance seemed to give Caderousse a little courage. Well, then, under these circumstances, said Caderousse, I will, I even believe I ought, to undeceive you as to the friendship which poor Edmund thought so sincere and unquestionable. Begin with his father, if you please, said the abbe. Edmund talked to me a great deal about the old man for whom he had the deepest love. The history is a sad one, said Caderousse, shaking his head. Perhaps you know all the earlier parts of it? Yes answered the abbe. Edmund related to me everything until the moment when he was arrested in a small cabaret close to Marseilles. At La Reserve? Oh, yes, I can see it. All before me this moment. Was it not his betrothal feast? It was, and the feast that began so gaily had a very sorrowful ending. A police commissary, followed by four soldiers, entered, and Dante's was arrested. Yes, and up to this point I know all, said the priest. Dante's himself only knew that which personally concerned him, for he never beheld again the five persons I have named to you, or heard mention of any of them. Well, when Dante's was arrested, Monsieur Morel hastened to obtain the particulars, and they were very sad. The old man returned alone to his home, folded up his wedding suit, with tears in his eyes, and paced up and down his chamber the whole day, and would not go to bed at all, for I was underneath him and heard him walking the whole night and for myself I assure you I could not sleep either, for the grief of the poor father gave me uneasiness, and every step he took went to my heart as really as if his foot had pressed against my breast. The next day Mercedes came to implore the protection of Monsieur de Villefort. She did not obtain it, however, and went to visit the old man, when she saw him so miserable and heartbroken, having passed a sleepless night and not touched food since the previous day, she wished him to go with her that she might take care of him, but the old man would not consent. No, was the old man's reply, I will not leave this house, for my poor dear boy loves me better than anything in the world, and if he gets out of prison he will come and see me the first thing, and what would he think if I did not wait here for him? I heard all this from the window, for I was anxious that Mercedes should persuade the old man to accompany her, for his footsteps over my head all night and day did not leave me a moment's repose. But did you not go upstairs and try to console the poor old man? asked the abbey. "'Ah, oh, sir,' replied Caderousse, "'we cannot console those who will not be consoled, "'and he was one of these. "'Besides, I know not why, but he seemed to dislike seeing me. "'One night, however, I heard his sobs, "'and I could not resist my desire to go up to him. "'But when I reached his door, he was no longer weeping, but praying. "'I cannot now repeat to you, sir, "'all the eloquent words and imploring language he made use of. "'It was more than piety, it was more than grief, "'and I, who am no cantor, and hate the Jesuits, said then to myself, It is really well, and I am very glad that I have not any children, for if I were a father and felt such excessive grief as the old man does, and did not find in my memory or heart all that he is now saying, I should throw myself into the sea at once, for I could not bear it. Poor father, murmured the priest. From day to day he lived on alone, and more and more solitary. Monsieur Morel and Mercedes came to see him, but his door was closed, and although I was certain he was at home, he would not make any answer. One day, when, contrary to his custom, he had admitted Mercedes, and the poor girl, in spite of her own grief and despair, endeavored to console him, he said to her, "'Be assured, my dear daughter, 
he is dead, and instead of expecting him, it is he who is awaiting us. I am quite happy, for I am the oldest, and of course shall see him first. However well disposed a person may be, you will see why we leave off after a time seeing persons who are in sorrow. They make one melancholy, and so at last old Dantes was left all to himself, and I only saw from time to time strangers go up to him and come down again with some bundle they tried to hide. But I guess what these bundles were, in that he sold by degrees what he had to, to pay for his sustenance. At length the poor old fellow reached the end of all he had. He owed three-quarters rent, and they threatened to turn him out. He begged for another week, which was granted to him. I know this, because the landlord came into my apartment when he left his. For the first three days I heard him walking about as usual, but on the fourth I heard nothing. I then resolved to go up to him at all risks. The door was closed, but I looked through the keyhole and saw him so pale and haggard that, believing him very ill, I went and told Monsieur Morel, and then ran on to Mercedes. They both came immediately, Monsieur Morel bringing a doctor, and the doctor said it was inflammation of the bowels, and ordered him a limited diet. I was there, too, and I shall never forget the old man's smile at this prescription. From that time he received all who came. He had an excuse for not eating any more. The doctor had put him on a diet. The abbey uttered a kind of groan. "'The story interests you, does it not, sir?' inquired Gatterus. "'Yes,' replied the abbey. "'It is very affecting.' Mercedes came again, and she found him so altered that she was even more anxious than before to have him taken to her own home. This was Monsieur Morel's wish also, who would fain have conveyed the old man against his consent. But the old man resisted and cried so that they were actually frightened. Mercedes remained, therefore, by his bedside, and Monsieur Morel went away, making a sign to the Catalan that he had left his purse on the chimney-piece. But availing himself of the doctor's order, the old man would not take any sustenance. At length, after nine days of despair and fasting, the old man died, cursing those who had caused his misery, and saying to Mercedes, If you ever see my Edmund again, tell him I die blessing him. The abbey rose from his chair, made two turns round the chamber, and pressed his temp trembling hand against his parched throat. And you believe he died... "'Of hunger, sir, of hunger,' said Caderousse. "'I am as certain of it as that we two are Christians.' The abbey, with a shaking hand, seized the glass of water that was standing by him half full, swallowed it at one gulp, and then resumed his seat, with red eyes and pale cheeks. "'This was indeed a horrid event,' said he in a hoarse voice. "'The more so, sir, as it was men's and not God's doing.' "'Tell me of those men,' said the abbey, "'and remember, too,' he added in an almost menacing tone, "'you have promised to tell me everything. "'Tell me, therefore, who are these men "'who killed the son with despair "'and the father with famine?' Two men jealous of him, sir, "'one from love and the other from ambition, "'Fernand and Danglars. "'How is this jealousy manifested? "'Speak on. "'They denounced Edmund as a Bonapartist agent. "'Which of the two denounced him?' Which was the real delinquent? Both, sir. One with a letter, and the other put it in the post. And where was this letter written? At La Reserve, the day before the betrothal feast. Twas so, then, twas so, then, murmured the abbey. Oh, Faria, Faria, how well did you judge men and things? What did you please to say, sir? Uh, nothing, nothing, replied the priest. Go on. It was Danglars who wrote the denunciation with his left hand, that his writing might not be recognized, and Fernand who put it in the post. But, exclaimed the abbey suddenly, you were there yourself. I, said Caderousse, astonished, who told you I was there? The abbey saw he had overshot the mark, and he added quickly, No one, but in order to have known everything so well, you must have been an eyewitness. True, true, said Caderousse in a choking voice, I was there. "'And did you not remonstrate against such infamy?' asked the abbey. "'If not, you were an accomplice.' "'Sir,' replied Caderousse, "'they had made me drink to such an excess "'that I nearly lost all perception. "'I had only an indistinct understanding "'of what was passing around me. "'I said all that a man in such a state could say, "'but they both assured me that it was a jest "'they were carrying on, and perfectly harmless. "'Next day, next day, sir, you must have seen plain enough what they had been doing, yet you said nothing, though you were present when Dantes was arrested.' "'Yes, sir. I was there, and very anxious to speak, 
but Danglars restrained me. If he should really be guilty, said he, and did really put into the island of Elba, if he is really charged with a letter for the Bonapartist Committee at Paris, and if they find this letter upon him, those who have supported him will pass for his accomplices. I confess I had my fears in the state in which politics then were, and I held my tongue. It was cowardly, I confess, but it was not criminal. I understand. You allowed matters to take their course, that was all. Yes, sir, answered Caderousse, and remorse preys on me night and day. I often ask pardon of God, I swear to you, because this action, the only one with which I have seriously to reproach myself in all my life, is no doubt the cause of my abject condition. I am expiating a moment of selfishness, and so I always say to La Carconte, when she complains, Hold your tongue, woman, it is the will of God. And Caderousse bowed his head with every sign of real repentance. Well, sir, said the abbe, you have spoken unreservedly, and thus to accuse yourself is to deserve pardon. Unfortunately, Edmund is dead, and has not pardoned me. He did not know, said the abbe. But he knows it all now, interrupted Caderousse. They say the dead know everything. There was a brief silence. The abbe rose and paced up and down pensively, and then resumed his seat. You have two or three times mentioned a Monsieur Morel, he said. Who is he? The owner of the Pharaon and patron of Dante's. And what part did he play in this sad drama? inquired the abbe. The part of an honest man, full of courage and real regard, twenty times he interceded for Edmund. When the emperor returned, he wrote, implored, threatened, and so energetically that on the second restoration he was persecuted as a Bonapartist. Ten times, as I told you, he came to see Dante's father, and offered to receive him in his own house, and the night or two before his death, as I have already said, he left his purse on the mantelpiece, with which they paid the old man's debts, and buried him decently. And so Edmund's father died, as he had lived, without doing harm to any one. I have the purse still by me, a large one, made of red silk. And, asked the abbe, is Monsieur Morel still alive? Yes, replied Caderousse. In that case, replied the abbe, he should be rich and happy. Caderousse smiled bitterly. Yes, happy as myself, said he. What? Monsieur Morel unhappy? exclaimed the abbe. He is reduced almost to the last extremity, nay, he is almost at the point of dishonour. How? Yes, continued Caderousse, so it is, after five and twenty years of labour, after having acquired a most honourable name in the trade of Marseille, Monsieur Morel is utterly ruined, he has lost five ships in two years, has suffered by the bankruptcy of three large houses, and his only hope now is in that very fair on which poor Dante is commanded and which is expected from the Indies with a cargo of cochineal and indigo. If this ship founders like the others, he is a ruined man. And has the unfortunate man wife or children? inquired the abbey. Yes, he has a wife, who through everything has behaved like an angel. He has a daughter, who is about to marry the man she loved, but whose family now will not allow him to wed the daughter of a ruined man. And he has besides a son— a lieutenant in the army, and, as you may suppose, all this, instead of lessening, only augments his sorrows. If he were alone in the world, he would blow out his brains, and there would be an end. Horrible! ejaculated the priest. And it is thus heaven recompenses virtue, sir, added Caderousse. You see, I, who never did a bad action but that I have told you of, am in destitution with my poor wife dying a fever before my very eyes, and I unable to do anything in the world for her. I shall die of hunger, as old Dantes did, while Fernand and Danglars are rolling in wealth. How is that? Because their deeds have brought them good fortune, while honest men have been reduced to misery. What has become of Danglars, the instigator, and therefore the most guilty? What has become of him? Why, he left Marseilles and was taken on the recommendation of Monsieur Morel, who did not know his crime, as cashier into a Spanish bank. During the war with Spain he was employed in the commissariat of the French army, and made a fortune. Then with that money he speculated in the funds, and trebled or quadrupled his capital, and having first married his banker's daughter, who left him a widower, he has married a second time a widow, a Madame de Nargon, daughter of Monsieur de Servieux, the king's chamberlain, who is in high favour at court. He is now a millionaire, and they have made him a baron and now he is the Baron Danglars, with a fine residence in the Rue de Mont Blanc, 
with ten horses in his stables, six footmen in his antechamber, and I know not how many millions in his strong box. Ah, said the abbe in a peculiar tone, he is happy. Happy? Who can answer for that? Happiness or unhappiness is the secret known but to oneself and the walls. Walls have ears, but no tongues. But if a large fortune produces happiness, Danglars is happy. And Fernand? Fernand? Why, much the same story. But how could a poor Catalan fisher boy without education or resources make a fortune? I confess this staggers me. And it has staggered everyone. There must have been in his life some strange secret that no one knows. But then, by what visible steps has he attained this high fortune or high position? Both, sir. He has both fortune and position. Both. This must be impossible. It would seem so. But listen, and you will understand. Some days before the return of the emperor, Fernand was drafted. The Bourbons let him quietly enough at the Catalans, but when Napoleon returned, a special levy was made, and Fernand was compelled to join. I went too, but as I was older than Fernand, and had just married my poor wife, I was only sent to the coast. Fernand was enrolled in the active troop, went to the frontier with his regiment, and was at the Battle of Ligny. A night after the battle, he was sent at the door of a general who carried on a secret correspondence with the enemy. That same night, the general was to go over to the English. He proposed to Fernand to accompany him. Fernand agreed to do so, deserted his post, and followed the general. Fernand would have been court-martialed if Napoleon had remained on the throne, but his action was rewarded by the Bourbons. He returned to France with, with the épaule of sub-lieutenant, and as the protection of the general, who was in the highest favor, was accorded to him, he was a captain in 1823, during the Spanish War, that is to say, at the time when Danglars made his early speculations. Fernand was a Spaniard, and being sent to Spain to ascertain the feeling of his fellow countrymen, found Danglars there, but on very intimate terms with him, won over the support of the royalists of the capital and in the provinces, received promises and made pledges on his own part, guided his regiment by paths known to himself alone through the mountain gorges which were held by the royalists, and, in fact, rendered such services in this brief campaign that after the taking of Trocadero he was made colonel and received the title of Count and the cross of an officer of the Legion of Honor. Destiny, destiny, murmured the abbey. Yes, but listen, this was not all. The war with Spain being ended, Fernand's career was checked by the long peace which seemed likely to endure throughout Europe. Greece only had risen against Turkey and had begun her war of independence. All eyes were turned towards Athens. It was the fashion to pity and support the Greeks. The French government, without protecting them openly, as you know, gave countenance to volunteer assistance. Fernand sought and obtained leave to go and serve in Greece, still having his name kept on the army roll. Some time after, it was stated that the Comte de Morcerf, this was the name he bore, had entered the service of Ali Pasha with the rank of Instructor General. Ali Pasha was killed, as you know, but before he died he recompensed the services of Fernand by leaving him a considerable sum, with which he returned to France when he was gazetted lieutenant-general. So that now, inquired the abbey, so that now, continued Caderousse, he owns a magnificent house, Nombre Vance, Rue de Elder, Paris. The abbey opened his mouth, hesitated for a moment, then making an effort at self-control, he said, And Mercedes, they tell me that she has disappeared. Disappeared? said Caderousse. Yes. As the sun disappears, to rise the next day with still more splendor. Has she made a fortune also? inquired the abbe, with an ironical smile. Mercedes is at this moment one of the greatest ladies in Paris, replied Caderousse. Go on, said the abbe. It seems as if I were listening to the story of a dream, but I have seen things so extraordinary that what you tell me seems less astonishing than it otherwise might. Mercedes was at first in the deepest despair at the blow which deprived her of Edmund. I have told you of her attempts to propitiate Monsieur de Villefort, her devotion to the elder Dantes, and the midst of her despair a new affliction overtook her. This was the departure of Fernand, a Fernand whose crime she did not know, and whom she regarded as her brother. Fernand went, and Mercedes remained alone. Three months passed, and still she wept. No news of Edmund, no news of Fernand no companionship save that of an old man who was dying with despair one evening after a day of accustomed vigil at the angle of two roads 
leading to Marseilles from the Catalans, she returned to her home, more depressed than ever. Suddenly she heard a step she knew, turned anxiously around. The door opened, and Fernand, dressed in the uniform of a sub-lieutenant, stood before her. It was not the one she wished for most, but it seemed as if a part of her past life had returned to her. Mercedes seized Fernand's hands with a transport which he took for love, but which was only joy at being no longer alone in the world, and seeing at last a friend, after long hours of solitary sorrow, and then, it must be confessed, Fernand had never been hated, he was only not precisely loved. Another possessed all Mercedes' heart. That other was absent, had disappeared, perhaps was dead. At this last thought, Mercedes burst into a flood of tears and wrung her hands in agony, but the thought, which she had always repelled before when it was suggested to her by another, came now in full force upon her mind. And then, too, old Dantes incessantly said to her, Our Edmund is dead. If he were not, he would return to us. The old man died, as I have told you. Had he lived, Mercedes, perchance, had not become the wife of another, for he would have been there to reproach her infidelity. Fernand saw this, and when he learned of the old man's death, he returned. He was now lieutenant. At his first coming he had not said a word of love to Mercedes. At the second he reminded her that he loved her. Mercedes begged for six months more in which to await and mourn for Edmund. So that, said the abbey with a bitter smile, that makes eighteen months in all. What more could the most devoted lover desire? Then he murmured the words of the English poet, Frailty, thy name is woman. Six months afterward, continued Caderousse, the marriage took place in the church of Acouz. The very church in which she was to have married Edmund, murmured the priest. There was only a change of bridegrooms. Well, Mercedes was married, proceeded Caderousse, but although in the eyes of the world she appeared calm, she nearly fainted as she passed La Reserve, where eighteen months before the betrothal had been celebrated with him whom she might have known she still loved had she looked to the bottom of her heart. Fernand, more happy, but not more at his ease, for I saw it at this time he was in constant dread of Edmund's return. Fernand was very anxious to get his wife away and to depart himself. There were too many unpleasant possibilities associated with the Catalans, and eight days after the wedding they left Marseilles. "'Did you ever see Mercedes again?' inquired the priest. "'Yes. During the Spanish War at Perpignan, where Fernand had left her, she was attending to the education of her son.' The abbey started. "'Her son?' said he. "'Yes,' replied Caderousse. "'Little Albert.' "'But, then, to be able to instruct her child,' continued the abbey, "'she must have received an education herself. "'I understood from Edmund that she was the daughter of a simple fisherman, "'beautiful but uneducated.' "'Oh,' replied Caderousse, "'did he know so little of his lovely betrothed? "'Mercedes might have been a queen, sir, if the, qu "'if the crown were to be placed on the heads "'of the loveliest and most intelligent. "'Fernand's fortune was already waxing great, "'and she developed with his growing fortune. "'She learned drawing, music, everything. "'Besides, I believe, between ourselves, "'she did this in order to distract her mind, "'that she might forget, "'and she only filled her head in order to alleviate "'the weight on her heart.' But now her position in life is assured, continued Caderousse. No doubt fortune and honours have comforted her. She is rich, a countess, and yet, Caderousse paused, and yet what? asked the abbey. Yet I am sure she is not happy, said Caderousse. What makes you believe this? Why, when I found myself utterly destitute, I thought my old friends would perhaps assist me. So I went to danglers who would not even receive me. I called on Fernand, who sent me a hundred francs by his valet de chambre then you did not see either of them no but madame de morcerf saw me how was that as i went away a purse fell at my feet it contained five and twenty louis i raised my head quickly and saw mercedes who at once shut the blind and monsieur de villefort asked the abbe oh he never was a friend of mine i did not know him and i had nothing to ask of him do you not know what became of him and the share he had in edmund's misfortunes no, I only know that some time after Edmund's arrest he married Mademoiselle de saint Meron, and soon after left Marseilles. No doubt he has been as lucky as the rest. No doubt he is as rich as Danglars, as high in station as Fernand. I only, as you see, have remained poor, wretched, and forgotten. You are mistaken, my friend, replied the abbey. God may seem sometimes to forget for a time while his justice reposes, but there always comes a moment when he remembers, and behold, a proof. As he spoke, the abbey took the diamond from his pocket, and, giving it to Caderousse, said, 
Here, my friend, take this diamond, it is yours. What, for me only? cried Caderousse. Ah, sir, do not jest with me. This diamond was to have been shared among his friends. Edmund had one friend only, and thus it cannot be divided. Take the diamond, then, and sell it. It is worth fifty thousand francs, and I repeat my wish that this sum may suffice to release you from your wretchedness. Oh, sir, said Caderousse, putting out one hand timidly, and with the other wiping away the perspiration which bedewed his brow. Oh, sir, do not make jests of the happiness or despair of a man. I know what happiness and what despair are, and I never make a jest of such feelings. Take it, then, but in exchange. Caderousse, who touched the diamond, withdrew his hand. The abbey smiled. In exchange, he continued, give me the red silk purse that Monsieur Morel left on old Dante's chimney piece, and which you tell me is still in your hands. Caderousse, more and more astonished, went toward a large oaken cupboard, opened it, and gave the abbey a long purse of faded red silk, round which were two copper runners that had once been gilt. The abbey took it, and in return gave Caderousse the diamond. "'Oh, you are a man of God, sir,' cried Caderousse, "'for no one knew that Edmund had given you this diamond, and you might have kept it.' "'Which,' said the abbey to himself, "'you would have done.' The abbey rose, took his hat and gloves. Well, he said, all you have told me is perfectly true, then, and I may believe it in every particular. See, sir, replied Caderousse, in this corner is a crucifix in holy wood. Here on this shelf is my wife's testament. Open this book, and I will swear upon it with my hand on the crucifix. I will swear to you by my soul's salvation, my faith as a Christian. I have told everything to you as it occurred, and as the recording angel will tell it to the year of God at the day of the last judgment. "'Tis well,' said the abbey, convinced by his manner and tone that Caderousse spoke the truth. "'Tis well, and may this money profit you. Adieu! I go far from men who thus so bitterly injure each other.' The abbey with difficulty got away from the enthusiastic thanks of Caderousse, opened the door himself, got out, and mounted his horse, once more saluted the innkeeper, who kept uttering his loud farewells, and then returned by the road he had travelled in coming. When Caderousse turned around, he saw behind him La Carconte, paler and trembling more than ever. "'Is, then, all that I have heard really true?' she inquired. "'What, that he has given the diamond to us only?' inquired Caderousse, half bewildered with joy. "'Yes, nothing more true. See, here it is.' The woman gazed at his moment, and then said, in a gloomy voice, "'Suppose it's false?' Caderousse started and turned pale. "'False?' he muttered. "'False? Why should that man give me a false diamond? "'To get your secret without paying for it, you blockhead!' Caderousse remained for a moment aghast under the weight of such an idea. "'Oh,' he said, taking up his hat, which he placed on the red handkerchief tied round his head, "'we will soon find out. In what way? "'Why, the fair is on at Beaucaire. There are always jewelers from Paris there, and I will show it to them. "'Look after the house, wife, and I shall be back in two hours.' And Caderousse left the house in haste, and ran rapidly in the direction opposite to that which the priests had taken. Fifty thousand francs,' muttered La Carconte, when left alone. "'It is a large sum of money, but it is not a fortune.'" End of chapter 27